she was a single mother building a better life for her and her daughter. My mom definitely looked at Princeton as a fresh start. Life got easier for her. She was happy. But a vicious attack would tear her family apart forever. There were five gunshot wounds. The stab wounds were primarily focused on her head. We could tell from that crime scene that she fought to the very end. Due to the nature of the victim's injuries, everything was on the table. Could this be something that was done just for financial gain? Could this be a jilted lover? The revelation of a secret affair will uproot one relationship and plant a deadly seed of jealousy in another. They wanted her out of the way. She gave him an ultimatum. You've got a month to get rid of her. He couldn't pick, you know, either or. He wanted to have both, and that's, that's not how it works. You had two individuals who, while professing their love for each other, let that so-called love drive them to the point that they were willing to take the life of another human being to keep it going. It's hard to comprehend how one human being can be so cruel to another. It was the ultimate betrayal. Twenty-five miles outside of Dallas, Princeton, Texas, is a rural town with suburban appeal. It's close enough to Dallas that some folks can live there and commute to Dallas, but it has a small town feel. But just after 6 p.m. on September 20th, 2017, the Collin County Sheriff's Office receives a disturbing call about one of the town's residents. Caden Graham hadn't heard from her mom, Kelly Underwood, in a few days, and I got a little worried, so drove over to her place in Princeton to see what was up. So I did reach out to her a couple times, and I didn't hear back from her, so that kind of, you know, raised a little suspicion for me, just because... We hadn't had an argument. There wasn't a reason for her to be ignoring me or not answering my text messages or my calls or anything like that. So that I did go over there. And as soon as I pulled up, it was kind of like I got just bad vibes completely. I went up the sidewalk and then I walked up. I knocked on the door for probably like 15 seconds, no answer. But then that last knock, like the door opened. As soon as I walked inside, you know, I, again, I called out to her. Her craft door was open. And I saw her, her feet. Um, and I remember walking around her, her little craft table. And she was just, she was just laying there. That's when I noticed, you know, the blood on her head. I remember kneeling down and. As soon as I, like, grazed my hand, like, to move it to go check her pulse, I actually touched her leg, and she was just high. And that's when I went into, like, major freak-out mode. She was so scared that she didn't want to touch anything or mess anything up, so she had called 911 from back outside the front of the house. First responders quickly arrive on scene and find a distraught Caden. Caden had described where her mother's body was found, and so they went upstairs to that room specifically, craft room across from the master bedroom. When they got there, they noticed with this horrific scene, blood around the room, things knocked over. The body had been there for a while, so there was no need to try to resuscitate because obviously Kelly Underwood had passed away. The way that she was laying, they could tell without even moving her initially that she had possibly suffered stab wounds and gunshot wounds. Detectives wonder who had done this to Kelly Underwood and why. One of the difficulties in any murder investigation is going back and trying to piece together exactly how it occurred. Born and raised in Mesquite, Texas, Kelly Underwood had always been a shining light in her small Texas community. Kelly had a bubbly personality. She loved to joke around and 
She was just always, you know, the, the fun person in the room. From an early age, Kelly had big plans for her future. She would talk about, you know, wanting to get married and have children and have a career, be successful. Kelly married uh, very soon after high school, and she had her first child. Unfortunately, that marriage didn't work out, and um, she remarried um, another man, Caden's father. They were married a few years, and then, uh, unfortunately, that didn't work out. She stayed in the Mesquite area and continued working, and, um, you know, it's a balance, it's a struggle for any single mom. Um, anybody that met her would say that, you know, her smile would light up a room. That's just the type of person that she was. In May 2001, Kelly was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. She uh, had to have surgery for a brain tumor that had been developing for quite some time. They removed her tumor on her brain stem and it left a portion of her face um, a little paralyzed. There would be days that, you know, I would walk downstairs and she would be like in the bathroom and couldn't feel the left side of her body. And, and as a teenager, that's really hard to see, you know. Our whole family supported her and, you know, tried to tell her it didn't matter that everybody has their own way of dealing with, with things. And she, she internalized a lot. She was very depressed. That's when Kelly decided it was time to make a change. One of her friends from high school, Tiffany, said, come to Princeton, you can look for a while while you get settled. We'll see about helping you get a job. Tiffany's husband, Ronnie, had a metal fabrication shop. Ronnie, his family lived there for, for decades. Ronnie hung around with, you know, a lot of people that were in the racing circle there in the small town in Princeton. Ronnie offered employment and a place to stay. You know, if you want to come work here, we can, you know, let you stay here with us until you find a place of your own. And um, that's what she did. She started working for, you know, Ronnie Wellborn at Express Fabrications. Um, she started out being a welder. Um, and I'm pretty sure after about a year and a half, that's when she moved into the office and started handling the, you know, the accounting, the books, um, and stuff like that. She really handled everything. I mean, she was the face of the company. She was very good at her job. Kelly also offered her boss, Ronnie, emotional support when his wife filed for divorce in May 2014. When he and Tiffany were going through the divorce, he would confide in Kelly, and she was there for him. He was there for her when she was going through a hard time, and, and she reciprocated. They became really good friends. Obviously, he was her boss, but he was also a friend. He was a supporter. I mean, he was always one of her biggest fans when it came down to it. As Ronnie adjusted to his new life, Kelly also became more independent. In the spring of 2017, she moved into a new house in Princeton. Hayden graduated. She moved in with friends, and Kelly was living alone. She enjoyed spending time in her backyard, so she wanted to put a pool in the backyard and um, enjoy and relax when she got home. My mom definitely looked... But on September 20th, 2017... Princeton police have been called to Kelly's home, where the 46-year-old has been found brutally murdered. It was a small town. It had crime, but it had not had a murder for 20 or 25 years. None of their detectives had ever investigated a homicide, and so they had the foresight to call the Texas Rangers to help them with that investigation. It was apparent from the moment our investigators walked into the room that she had lost her life in a violent way and in a struggle. Our investigators looked at it uh, through the lens of, could this be a jilted lover? Could this be something that was done um, just for financial gain? Everything was on the table. Coming up, homicide investigators find evidence that suggests possible persons of interest. It looked like people had been hanging out after they murdered her. It's absolutely disgusting. It led us to believe that we had two perpetrators instead of just one person doing the crime. And the search for clues will lead police to uncover an unexpected relationship. There would be text messages where they were telling each other they loved each other. 
And then a couple days later, they were in a heated argument. Princeton, Texas, 46-year-old single mother Kelly Underwood has been found brutally murdered in her home. Detectives are meticulously processing the crime scene in order to help piece together what happened. We collected five 22 spent cartridge cases in the uh, craft room. Kelly had a gunshot wound to her ankle. She had a couple gunshot wounds to her left upper arm but she also had two gunshot wounds that had pierced her chest the stab wounds were primarily focused on her head so she had one through her right temple she had one that entered her skull and she had a couple in her neck she also had some other what they called superficial or incised wounds that really didn't penetrate deeply but were clearly from the same sharp object it's not very common for someone to use two different weapons um, on, a, on a victim. And therefore, in this case, it, it at least led us to believe that we had two perpetrators instead of just one person doing the crime. As Kelly's body is removed for autopsy, investigator... In her bedroom, we found her cell phone. In modern day investigations, cell phones are invaluable. We all live with our cell phones. We all use our cell phones. If you want to know anything about someone, you can pretty much figure it out with a cell phone. Next, investigators make their way downstairs, where Kelly's 19-year-old daughter, Caden Graham, helps them to identify additional clues. You go into the living room, which the front door opens up into, and there's areas that looks a bit chaotic. Over in the corner, there was an obvious disturbance where the surveillance equipment was pulled out and it just looked like it had been yanked out and just thrown on the floor. Nothing else appears to have been stolen, so investigators dismiss robbery as a likely motive. What was interesting about this crime scene was we didn't see entry being made through a broken door or a broken window. It looked like it was someone who had been invited in. Now, there were used plates and utensils on the counter. That was unusual to Caden and stood out. My mom was very OCD. Everything, when it came down to her, it was clean, clean, clean. She didn't like anything being dirty. Caden quickly points out another inconsistency. When we went out into the backyard, photographed it. It looked like, you know, people had been hanging out back there as well. We collected some cigarette butts. My mom didn't smoke cigarettes either, so that was another thing that I was like, she would not be okay with cigarette butts being, you know, sprawled out all throughout her backyard. It looked like, you know, people had hung out out there after they murdered her. That tells you the lack of conscience they have, the lack of respect for life as a whole that they have. And it's absolutely disgusting. Those were obviously important pieces of evidence for us to try to collect and also get tested for possible DNA evidence. The following day, the Collin County Medical Examiner performs an autopsy to recover more evidence. Scrapings were taken from underneath Kelly's fingernails, and that was preserved and passed forward for uh, DNA. Based on the rigor mortis, the window of death was somewhere in the late evening of September 16th to the very early morning hours of September 17th. After the autopsy, investigators conduct an extended interview with Caden Graham. Any good murder investigation is going to leave no stone unturned. And if you start off without looking at everyone as a suspect, then you do a disservice to the case. They sat Caden down, questioned her, checking for an and we were in a good place. I had just called her the Friday before to tell her that I was going to be looking for a new job. And she was talking me through it and, and supporting me. And so when I didn't hear from her for a couple days, I just finally went over there to check on her. They asked to uh, look at her cell phone, any communications with our victim, and, and she willingly complied. They made me 
immediately started looking in her phone and saw that Caden had tried to get in touch with her mom more than once in the days of September 15th and September 16th, which was the Friday and Saturday before she was deceased. Police asked Caden for a detailed account of her whereabouts over the past few days. Caden had been living with a family close by, a friend and her parents. Caden also had a boyfriend at the time, and so the rangers did every follow-up that they needed to. The rangers asked the consent of that family to search the home to see if they could find a matching murder weapon. They did not find any murder weapon that would have matched the one that killed Kelly, which was specifically a 22 caliber. Based on the victim's daughter's cell phone records, based on other witnesses, um, and based on the time of the offense, it became very clear that, that she was not involved in this offense. At the beginning, I did feel that they were a little too focused on me and asking me too many questions, and it did raise a little bit of worry. I would never do this. I would never hurt her. Over a certain period of time, they were like, okay, we know that you had nothing to do with it, and we thank you for, you know, working with us and being understanding. That was was my main thing, was making sure that I did everything that they asked, just to make sure that they, they found the right people, that they weren't focused on the wrong people. Investigators begin canvassing Kelly Underwood's neighborhood, searching for anyone who can speak to her final days. Investigators with the Princeton Police Department and the Texas Rangers asked neighbors if they had seen any individuals out of the ordinary over at the house. There was a neighbor that reported last seeing Kelly was a white male who drove a truck with Illinois license plates. The neighbors had also described a black male who had been over there in the garage helping with work on September 16th, the dates that we believe that our murder happened. But who were these two men? And what connection, if any, could they possibly have to Kelly's murder? In order to find out, police know they have to find both men, and fast. They obviously want to speak with them. What had happened? What did they know? Six-year-old Kelly Underwood was found murdered in her Princeton, Texas home. Investigators have learned about two men seen at Kelly's home in the time frame they believe she was killed. Unfortunately, none of the neighbors are able to identify the men by name, but they believe the men were there to work on Kelly's house. Kelly had some things, you know, she wanted done around the house. She needed her pool put in, and she's having problems with her cameras at home and one of them replaced hoping to identify the two workers investigators reach out to kelly's associates they start with her boss and close friend ronnie wellborn who appears devastated by the news of her murder it absolutely was a shock to ronnie they were very close Ronnie was like mental support throughout the whole situation. I mean, when I found her up until the funeral, when I went up to the funeral home to, you know, make arrangements and everything, he was very adamant about being a part of it. He wanted to make sure that I had support and that I didn't feel alone. When investigators meet with Ronnie, he quickly offers them a crucial lead. He did know that she was getting some work done in her backyard, and he provided the name of Robert Veal as the person who was helping her do that work in her backyard. Robert Veal was an old friend of Ronnie's, a racing buddy, had worked for Ronnie for a while, and Kelly was well aware of him also. Unfortunately, Ronnie says he doesn't know who the second man that neighbors had reported seeing at the home could be. When their calls to Robert Veal go unanswered, investigators examine Kelly Underwood's phone records, searching for information that will help to identify the second worker. But what they discover points the case in a whole new direction. So at that time, the Rangers had reviewed Kelly's phone and saw that there was some sort of romantic relationship, not just a business relationship, between Kelly and Ronnie. There would be text messages where they were telling each other they loved each other, and Ronnie couldn't wait to make her Mrs. Wellborn. But 
but texts reveal that Kelly and Ronnie's romance had also been quite volatile. A couple days later, they were in a heated argument. And, you know, Kelly never wanted to see him again. Investigators ask Kelly's daughter, Caden, about the relationship. She confirms her mother and Ronnie had had an on-again, off-again romance going back. He was showing up to the house a lot more. We were going to do stuff with him and going to dinners, shopping. And that's when I kind of picked up on this is kind of becoming more than a friendship. Kelly hid the relationship that she had with Ronnie from the family. Kelly worked for Ronnie and she knew that, you know, it's probably not the right thing to do dating your boss. So no one really knew about it except for Caden and Caden kept it a secret as well. Caden also claims to know why her mother's relationship with Ronnie was so tumultuous. I told him Katie Robinson. Like, that's, that's the main person that came to my head. Caden says one weekend at the races, Ronnie met this young woman named Katie. A sweet Texas girl from uh, Pilot Point, Texas. She was 20 years younger than him, but apparently they hit it off. They developed a relationship, and Katie became pregnant, and Katie ended up moving in with Ronnie. This all was happening simultaneously with the relationship with Kelly, and then Kelly found out about it. She actually wanted to leave the company. She didn't want to work for Ronnie any longer, but Ronnie really didn't want to lose her because she was good at what she did. Caden tells police that her mother eventually came to terms with the situation. She even tried to befriend Ronnie's new girlfriend. We actually bought her gifts um, for her baby, and my mom went to go drop it off to her. At that time, my mom did end the relationship with Ronnie, and she did apologize and, you know, for, you know, kind of like any overstepping that happened because Katie was pregnant. Despite Kelly's attempt to make peace, Katie never took kindly to Ronnie's ongoing relationship with a former lover. He could pick, you know, either or. He wanted to have both, and that's that's not how it works. According to Caden, the situation came to a head one week before her mother's murder. When Ronnie was at work every day at the shop, Katie would take his oldest daughter to school. And she could see Kelly's front door, her sidewalk, and her street from the parent drop-off loop. About a week before Kelly's death, she sees Ronnie's truck at Kelly's house, and she becomes furious. Katie came over to Kelly's house, and in the front yard, there was a very loud verbal altercation. Two Texas women bunny heads hard. My mom did come outside and tell her, you know, to get off her property. Katie did cuss at her and stuff like that. More so try to instigate something to where my mom would do something, but my mom didn't do anything physical. She just, you know, got loud with her and was like, I don't show up to your house like this. Police can't help but wonder, could the heated love triangle have resulted in Kelly Underwood's murder? Because of the nature of crime itself. We, we had a crime that was a violent killing, and to find out that the boss was having a relationship with our victim uh, changed the dynamic in the way we looked at him. Coming up, as investigators unravel a tense romantic rivalry, Kelly's daughter chases a potential lead and catches a major break. There are some individuals who prefer not to speak to law enforcement. So Kaden took it upon herself to go out. I felt that I needed answers and I just needed to know like what happened. after Kelly Underwood was found dead in her Princeton, Texas home. Investigators have discovered that Kelly was having an affair with her close friend and boss, Ronnie Wellborn. They immediately bring him in for another round of questioning and confront him with the new information. Ronnie uh, comes clean. He says that after his breakup with his wife, Tiffany, and the divorce, he was single and lonely. Kelly was single and lonely. They got together, and they have been seeing each other for a few years. Ronnie says that he loves Kelly, that 
he sees her regularly, even though he has Katie Robinson living with him. He told investigators that he had actually been over there about midday Friday, September 15th, the day before Kelly's murder, seen her alive, actually helped her move some sort of storage chest in her garage, and that was the last time that he saw her. Ronnie provides investigators with an alibi, which they quickly verify. Investigators then, of course, uh, wanted to interview Katie. She was forthcoming that she did not like Kelly, that she knew of this secret relationship. Katie was asked about the confrontation. She described it as, you know, more traumatic for her, right? That she's just trying to figure out what the father of her child is doing at this other woman's house, and she gets confronted and yelled at and, and pretty scared. Like Ronnie, Katie also insists that she has no idea what happened to Kelly Underwood or why. While they admitted the fact that the relationship between Kelly and Ronnie was a friction point for their relationship, they quickly told investigators that that was no reason why anyone should lose their life. In a million years, they wouldn't. He also provides investigators with a verifiable alibi. With no reason to hold the couple, investigators next focus their efforts on tracking down Ronnie's former employee, Robert Veal. We actually had trouble finding Robert Veal. Um, we believe he was trying to run from the police. At the same time, Kelly's daughter, Caden Graham, does some investigating of her own. I felt that I needed answers, and I just needed to know, like, what happened. So I went to, you know, neighbors' houses. There are some individuals who prefer not to speak to law enforcement, um, may have their own rough past with law enforcement, and they weren't getting any concrete information from some of those neighbors. So Kaden took it upon herself um, to go out and talk to one of the neighbors who had described a black male being across the street at Kelly's house. The neighbor actually knew the black male because they had spent some time together in county jail. He only knew the nickname that he went by, um, and he told me that he went by D. Caden was able to pull up a Facebook photo to identify who D was as Delvin Powell. And then she passed that information along back to the Texas Rangers. When they ran the information for Delvin Powell, they found that Delvin had an outstanding warrant for an unrelated domestic violence charge. They found him through his girlfriend at the time. She had been reached out to and contacted, and ultimately they were tracked back to a motel in the Princeton area. Police take Delvin Powell into custody on the outstanding warrant for assault. They also search his hotel room for any evidence that might connect him to Kelly Underwood's brutal murder. When investigators searched the hotel room, they found a bag. And in that bag, there were knives and there was also a container of 22 caliber ammunition. The exact same caliber that was used to kill Kelly Underwood. Same brand, same caliber. Back at the station, police pressed Delvin Powell about the murder of Kelly Underwood, hoping to get a confession. They confronted Delvin with the fact that he had been at the house, and he admitted to as much. He said that he was there helping Robert with the work on Kelly's house, but he didn't really know Kelly, didn't really interact with her directly. His story was, the last time I saw her on September 16th, she was alive. Investigators obtain a while they continue their search for Robert Veal. Then, on September 28th, authorities catch a break when an informant notifies them that Robert's truck has been spotted outside his house. Texas Rangers and investigators to the home of Robert Beale to talk to him about what he knew. Authorities immediately take Robert into custody and transport him to headquarters. In an interrogation room, investigators press Robert about his truck being spotted at Kelly's house the day she was murdered. Robert Beale admitted, I was doing work for her. Yes, I knew her. I was in her house. The last time I saw her was September 16th, and in fact, I've tried to call 
hadn't gotten in touch with her since because she wasn't answering me. He didn't really have a good explanation for, okay, if you'd been over at her house every day, sometimes for multiple hours a day, sometimes all day doing this work, why didn't you ever call police when she never responded to you? Why didn't you try to figure out what happened to her? He didn't have a good answer for that. As the interview continues, Veal's behavior becomes increasingly suspicious. They notice him start to manipulate his phone underneath his chair. They are worried that he is trying to destroy evidence right in front of them. The Rangers immediately grabbed him and seized that cell phone as he attempted to erase information from it. Investigators examine the remaining contents in Robert Veal's cell phone and are surprised to find a series of incoming text messages from Ronnie Wellborn's girlfriend, Katie Robinson. Katie is demanding Robert to call her, asking what is going on. Robert and Katie didn't have any kind of prior relationship that they should be communicating at all. Despite their suspicions, the text messages alone aren't enough evidence to keep Robert Veal in custody. Before releasing him, they take DNA samples from Robert and continue building their case against the four suspects. Then, while they wait for results from the crime lab, investigators receive an unexpected call about Katie Robinson. Texas Rangers received a tip from a woman who used to work with Katie, said that she had recently had lunch with her, and Katie just said something kind of odd to her. Katie had essentially said that she was glad that Kelly was gone. On November 15th, investigators arrange another interview with... We know more than, than you think we do. It's time to come clean. And she ultimately gave information that only somebody who was involved with this crime and planning this crime would know. Two months after the murder of Kelly Underwood, Katie Robinson has agreed to cooperate with investigators and immediately implicates her boyfriend, Ronnie Wellborn, as the man responsible for Kelly's death. Katie claims that Ronnie had hired 34-year-old Robert Beale to commit the crime. But she swears she had nothing to do with the conspiracy herself. Katie admitted that there was a plan, but Katie's take at this time was, I wasn't involved. She painted the picture that these other three people had gotten rid of Kelly. Texas Rangers, they of course, brought Ronnie Wellborn right back in to discuss the latest take on what was happening. It wasn't an aggressive interview by the Texas Rangers. It was just, we know now. We know exactly what happened. We know more. And this is now your opportunity to come clean. And he did. What Ronnie tells investigators is that he had offered Robert Veal $8,000. He provided Robert Veal a 22 caliber firearm the morning of Kelly's murder. Robert Veal was the kind of person who, while he was more than willing to commit a murder, didn't want to do it alone. And he brought his friend Delvin Powell in to, to commit the murder with him. Based on the evidence, Detectives theorize that on the morning of September 16th, Robert and Delvin arrived at Kelly's house under the guise that they were there to build her pool. She had been upstairs in the craft room when they decided to come upstairs and attack her because she had no way out. She tried to fight them off and they shot her and they stabbed her. begged for them to stop, and they looked her in the eye as they took her life. And then the perpetrators went downstairs. Evidence shows they had a meal. They smoked some cigarettes at some time and sort of just chilled out with this person they have just murdered upstairs. Asked why he'd put a hit out on Kelly, Ronnie claims he was tired of the drama brewing between the two women in his life. Murder. 
Ronnie took all of the responsibility. He tried to distance Katie from um, actually participating, even trying to claim that she really knew nothing about the murder, which ultimately we didn't believe. Following his confession, investigators arrest Ronnie and continue building their case against Katie Robinson. When they receive Katie's cell phone records, their suspicions are confirmed. Ronnie was physically and emotionally involved with two very headstrong Texas women. Katie uh, had a child with him, so about a month before the murder, Katie gave him an ultimatum. On August 18th, she tells him that he has one month till September 18th to figure out a way to get Kelly out of their lives. Katie was sending texts to uh, Ronnie Wellborn saying, your time's running out, I'm going to take the kid and go. Ronnie thought that his only apparent way out was to kill Kelly. In November 2017, all four suspects are charged with capital murder. Kelly's friends and family are both relieved and stunned. I was just kind of like, no, there's no way. Like, you know, he was my mom's best friend. He would never do anything to hurt us. No person that has a heart would ever in a million years do that to somebody that they love. It was the ultimate betrayal. It's hard to comprehend how one human being can be so cruel to another. In late 2019 and early 2020, Delvin Powell and Robert Veal are separately tried and convicted for the murder of Kelly Underwood. Ultimately, the forensic DNA that we received back from our um, Texas Department of Public Safety crime lab was that Robert Veal's DNA was confirmed on one of the utensils found in Kelly's kitchen, and so was Delvin Powell's DNA confirmed on one of those utensils. Delvin Powell's DNA was also on one of the cigarette butts. Additionally, there was DNA found consistent with Delvin's male DNA profile underneath Kelly's fingernails. Robert and Delvin are both sentenced to life without parole. In October 2020, Ronnie Wellborn pleads guilty to avoid his own trial. We were informed by his attorneys that he was willing to do the right thing, accept responsibility, plead guilty. A few months later, Katie Robinson also takes a plea bargain. Ultimately, we determined that the right result in her case was a plea of guilty to 30 years in prison. That one didn't sit well with me at all. The driving force behind the, the murders was Katie Robinson. 100%. Without her constant connection with both Ronnie and Robert Beale, my sister would still be here today. I do feel that, that Katie was the mastermind, but also Ronnie had a role in that as well because he did provide the money and, and you know, the weapon that was used. But none of it would have happened if it wasn't for Katie. One of the particularly scary issues with with this case was the fact that you had two individuals who while professing their love for each other let that so-called love drive them to the point that they were willing to take the life of another human being to keep it going it's scary that there's individuals out there like this it took me a lot of time to process kelly's death even now there are times when it doesn't seem real that she's gone I want her to be remembered by being that, you know, that lady that helped everybody when they needed it, or she was always happy. She always had a smile on her face. The laughter that she would create and, and the fun of being around her, she'll be missed forever. national headlines. Nancy Pfister was the toast of her ritzy mountain oasis. 
Everybody wanted to be like Nancy. Everybody wanted to meet her. She didn't have a problem in the world. She was briefly engaged to Michael Douglas. When the Kennedys would come into town, she would party with them. In Aspen, she was the queen, for sure. But a harrowing crime would send shockwaves through the glamorous Aspen community. Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. I got my head in the closet. <laughs> the body was completely wrapped in garbage bags. They see blonde hair and they notice, obviously, that it's a female. The investigation would capture media attention around the nation. Everybody was shocked at this gruesome murder here of a very well-loved local woman who had everything going for her. As police search for answers, they'll uncover a desperate conspiracy, one that culminates in a tell-all confession that would leave those closest to the case shaken to their core. She is the most self-loathing person that I've ever met. That was just another indication to me that they were being framed. She screwed us up big time. They bonded over their mutual, I have to say, hatred. What desperate people do sometimes is lash out. Beverly Hills of the Rocky Mountains. Aspen, Colorado is the winter retreat for the rich and famous. Aspen is a playground for billionaires. You can get a beautiful house here. You can land your jet within five minutes of downtown. The skiing is 100% world class. But on the evening of February 26, 2014, the glitz and glamour of the Aspen community would dissolve into chaos when local police dispatchers receive a frantic 911 call. Oh, oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! 911, what is the address of the emergency? Oh, my God! Oh, my God. Oh. Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. Oh, okay. My friend my, my had a... I got my friend in the closet. <laughs> what is your name, ma'am? Okay, is your friend a male or a female? Female, Nancy Fister. Born in 1956, Nancy Fister was brought up in an exclusive community. Nancy is the daughter of Art Fister. Art Fister was a rancher that owned the property that was eventually developed into the Buttermilk Ski Area and the West Buttermilk Super Exclusive Housing Developments. The Fisters were like Aspen royalty. Everyone catered to them because they basically helped put Aspen on the map. If her parents were royalty, Nancy was Aspen's princess. She was like Aspen's daughter. The kid that grew up that had everything. Everybody wanted to be like Nancy. Everybody wanted to meet her. She didn't have a problem in the world. She was Aspen's welcome wagon. She was very friendly and outgoing and gregarious. She was briefly engaged to Michael Douglas. She was a girlfriend to Jack Nicholson. When the Kennedys would come into town, she would party with them. You would see Nancy in town, and she was the sparkle. I mean, you knew that if you followed along with her, you were going to find some fun. Believe me, there was going to be some Prosecco. There was always someone to meet and someone to have fun with. She had the charm and the magic, and like the Pied Piper, you just followed her. By the early 2000s, one of Nancy's closest followers was her best friend and personal assistant, Kathy Carpenter. Kathy Carpenter was a bank teller at Alpine Bank in Aspen. This was the bank that Nancy Pfister banked at. Nancy Pfister, at one point, invited Kathy Carpenter to, to become her personal assistant. Kathy Carpenter really cared about Nancy Pfister. She became her person, like to drive her different places. And I think she enjoyed it because she got invited around to places and things that she probably would not have gotten invited to had she not been with Nancy Pfister. As a personal assistant, Kathy's biggest job was helping Nancy manage the rental of her luxurious chalet. 
She would rent out her home on Buttermilk Mountain when she would leave town during the winter. She was traveling all over the world. In November 2013, the 57-year-old socialite chose Australia for a six-month getaway. Nancy Pfister wanted to go to Australia not only to get out of the cold weather of Aspen in the winter, but she was an adventurous woman, and she was thinking of potentially buying some property in Australia. Nancy had told friends she'd be returning in May of 2014. But on February 26th, three months before winter, who tells them she's just found Nancy's body inside her Aspen home. Okay, is she breathing? She's dead from a blood rash in a tree. Kathy Carpenter was screaming into the 911 dispatch officer, my friend is dead, my friend is dead. Ma'am, stay on the line with me. I'm going to have some additional questions for you, okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, are you with your friend now? No, no, I left the house. I ran out of the house. Kathy is frantic and screaming. She had just found her friend dead and didn't want to go back in the house, so she actually got in her car and starts driving down the mountain. Where are you? I'm driving to town. When deputies arrive, they realize Kathy is in serious distress. She was so distraught that they had to use a sedative to calm her down. While Kathy is being treated, deputies race to Nancy Fister's house to investigate her claims. Responding deputies go into the house. And in the call, they had been directed to the closet in, in this house. So they go to the closet. He opens the door. He's not immediately seeing a body. He takes a look on the floor at his pile of laundry. It looks like sheets on the floor. And he bends down and he pulls a sheet back and he sees a bit of shoulder. He reaches down, checks for signs of life. Having found none, he retreats and the death investigation turns into a murder investigation. Coming up, as investigators dig deeper into their victim's life, unsavory secrets come to light. He sent Nancy Pfister an email saying, be careful what you wish for. You may get more than you expect. It's always interesting when someone is saying very openly how much they don't like the deceased. Investigators believe they have just found the body of 57-year-old socialite Nancy Fister inside her bedroom closet. The body was completely wrapped in gaunt hair, and they notice, obviously, that it's a female. And so, at that point, they're pretty sure that it's Nancy Fister. That trash bag around the head ended up concealing the actual cause of death. That was blunt force trauma to the head. But something about the crime scene doesn't add up for investigators. There was a smear of blood that was noticed on the headboard of the bed in the master bedroom. There was some droplets of blood, maybe spray on the bedroom wall, but not substantial amounts of blood that you would think based upon the head injuries that we were seeing on the body of Fister. As detectives take a closer look at Nancy's bed, they make a telling discovery. There was an area of a sizable amount of blood on the underside of the mattress. So we know our killer took the time and they worked to conceal what had actually happened. Based on the blood evidence, investigators believe Nancy had been attacked while she slept. As they continue processing the scene, they find little evidence to suggest a motive. 
They weren't seeing a ransacked bedroom where somebody was going through drawers and dumping drawers and looking for jewelry and things like that. There was no evidence of that. While Nancy Fister's body is transported to the medical examiner's office for autopsy, investigators circle back to Nancy's friend and the woman who called 911, Kathy Carpenter, for more information. Once Kathy calms down, she meets with investigators at the police department and they ask her to walk them through the crime scene and how she came to find Nancy's body. And she tells them that Nancy just returned from Australia a few days before. She had to go over to the house to check on the dog, Gabe, and she knew that Nancy Fister would be sleeping because, you know, she'd be jet lagged. When Kathy arrived, she noticed the dog hadn't been fed and had gone to the bathroom inside Nancy's house multiple times. It's obvious that something is wrong. She goes up the stairs and she sees what looks like blood stains on the headboard. She looks to the closet and she noticed that the key that she had left in it was gone. She went and grabbed her spare set of keys. Nancy's house and she unlocked the closet door and at that point she says she saw a figure in the corner wrapped in garbage bags. That's when Kathy drops a bombshell. She believes she knows who killed her best friend, the couple who had been renting Nancy Fister's home while she was in Australia, Trey and Nancy Styler. Trey Styler was a young resident in 1980 at the very prestigious University of Colorado Hospital in Denver when he met Nancy Styler. She was a nurse anesthetist at the time. She was very wowed and impressed by Trey Styler's intelligence. He, in turn, was surprised at someone with her looks. The pair eventually married and had a son. For the next 30 years, Trey's career and their fortunes continued to rise. He finally became chief of anesthesiology at St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver, which is another quite acclaimed hospital. They were living in a suburb of Denver called Greenwood Village, which is a quite affluent suburb in a very large house. But things took a turn for the worse when Trey's health began to deteriorate in his early 60s. And he was diagnosed with a degenerative nerve condition called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. He was not able to stand for long periods of time and had to use a wheelchair at other times. He could hardly walk down the stairs. I don't know how he was functioning. He was either in so much pain or he was so sick he could barely do anything. Because of his health condition, Trey was no longer able to practice medicine and the couple had to look for new avenues to make money. Nancy wanted to get into the skincare thing because being a nurse, she could do Botox and she could do treatments that were expensive. So that would be an opportunity for her to make a lot of money. So they had this idea to go up to Aspen. They knew that that's where the money was and that's where they wanted to start the spa business. The Styler story won Nancy Fister over. Nancy Fister and the Stylers worked agreement where the Stylers would rent her house for six months. The Stylers would pay her $12,000, $6,000 up front, and then $6,000 when they moved in as part of that agreement. When they met, they, they were buddies, you know. Nancy Fister would take her to the hot springs and, oh, I'm going to introduce you to my wealthy friends in Aspen so that you'll have, you know, professional contacts. Nancy also invited the Stylers to move in early so she could help them settle in before she left for trip. When they moved into Nancy Fister's house, she Nancy Fister was six before she took off. In November 2013, Nancy Fister left for Australia. But it wasn't long after that her relationship and rental agreement with the Stylers quickly began to unravel. Eight weeks after she left the country, Nancy Fister had emailed Kathy Carpenter from Australia claimed that the Stylers still owed her thousands of dollars in rent. 
Trey Styler and Nancy Pfister were on Facebook together. They were friends. And she started posting really negative things on Facebook. And Trey was seeing this. And this is when Nancy Styler really became angry because she was ruining their reputation, basically, and their prospects of being able to meet new people, get new clients, because Nancy Pfister was very influential. She was sending them group emails. Kathy Carpenter was CC'd. Everybody was on this email. Help me. Do something with these people. Get them out of there. Get me my money. Anything. Do something. And it was an ongoing theme. I heard less about her happiness there than I did about her anger about not getting the money. Kathy tells police that by mid-February, Nancy Pfister decided to fly home from Australia three months early to take care of the issue in person. Nancy Pfister told the Stylers that she would be back in Aspen in a few days and to get all of their belongings out. Once Nancy got back to town, uh, the Stylers moved out of her house and rented a hotel room in Basalt, which is down Valley from Aspen. They moved some of their belongings out of her house, but there were still hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment still left in the house that they were going to use to build their spa that Nancy refused to give back them until they paid her the money she said they owed her. Nancy Fister says you owe me $14,000. You damaged my furniture. You did other things around my house. I'm not going to give you back your equipment, this expensive equipment that Nancy Styler had for in her spa business, unless you hand over $14,000. I mean, they didn't have anything approaching $14,000. That's what Trey basically told Kathy Carpenter. We can't come up with this money. He was already angry. His wife was already angry, very angry with Nancy Pfister. Trey Styler at one point sent Nancy Pfister an email saying, be careful what you wish for. You may get more than you expect. town of Aspen, Colorado is reeling after police find 57-year-old Nancy Pfister dead. Especially to somebody like Nancy Pfister. She doesn't have an enemy in the world. Nancy's best friend, Kathy Carpenter, has implicated the late socialites' former friends and tenants, 65-year-old Trey Styler and his 62-year-old wife, Nancy, as her possible killers. Within about 12 hours of finding Nancy Pfister's body, police went to the hotel in Basalt where Kathy said the Stylers were staying. They asked them to come in and answer some questions. At the station, when investigators confront Nancy about her and her husband's feud with Nancy Pfister, she doesn't deny it. Instead, she tells police that Nancy Pfister had been a demanding landlord since the moment they moved into her home. Nancy Styler told police that initially the relationship between the couple and Nancy Pfister, they became fast friends, but once the Stylers signed the lease on her house, the relationship quickly changed and went downhill. And for two days, she was good until she got our money. And the deal was kind of, you know, sealed. Right. And then she treated me like a slave. Nancy Pfister would say things like, bring me my champagne, darling, or rub my feet, darling, or rub my neck, darling. And she would say this to both Nancy Styler and Trey Styler. And Nancy Styler also said that Nancy Pfister would walk around the house nude in front of her husband. And that didn't sit well. So Trey Styler told his wife, just be patient. She's going to be leaving in a few weeks. We could put up with her for a little bit longer. But you could tell it was getting to Nancy Styler. She was very forthcoming in her dislike for Nancy Pfister. Now, hating someone doesn't mean you kill them. But it's always interesting when law enforcement talks to someone and that someone is saying very openly how much they don't like the deceased. When detectives press Nancy Styler about their whereabouts the past week, she claims she and her husband hadn't seen Nancy Pfister since she returned from Australia. Nancy 
Skyler said that the last time they'd been to Nancy Fister's house was to move their belongings out because they didn't want to see Nancy Fister once she returned from her trip. Once Nancy returned from her trip, they didn't have access to the house, so they couldn't have been there when Nancy Fister was killed. In another interrogation room, Trey Styler echoes his wife's out. And made the situation uncomfortable. Mr. Styler had run into some severe difficulties in his life, um, career-wise, financially. I don't think Nancy brought in much money, as I recall. Um, they ended up in pretty dire financial straits, and they were trying to rebuild their life up here. Do you feel bad about what you've done? Hello. Sensing their suspicions, Trey quickly points out his physical ailments to police. He had to leave his medical profession because he could no longer physically meet the demands of his job in the operating room by standing. By this point, law enforcement knows, hmm, whoever this killer was, flipped a big, bulky, heavy, king-sized mattress. Whoever the killer or killers was, moved a body. They're thinking there needs to be some strength there, some stature there. That's kind of hard to do on your own. So, Trey and Nancy Styler, no evidence to hold them, no evidence they had committed any type of crime. They're released, and they go back down to Basalt to their motel room, where they sit. We had had a deputy sitting, watching that room. The following day, police receive a call from a sanitation worker in Basalt, who believes he has just made a crucial discovery. That Friday, uh, one of the workers whose job was to pick up the recyclable material went into one of these dumpsters where the material was, and there are very strict rules that you cannot put personal trash in there. He saw a bag that appeared to be personal trash. He was annoyed. He opened it up. What was remarkable about that trash bag is in it had prescription medication bottles with the name of Nancy Fister. In this small valley, in this small community, the gentleman that checked on that immediately knew he had come across something that might be of interest to law enforcement. When investigators arrive, they collect several more valuable pieces of evidence. A document that was of extreme interest that was found in this trash bag was a vehicle registration belonging to none other than William Trey Styler uh, and his vehicle. And then we found a bloody hammer. This was the first evidentiary connection between one of the stylers and a piece of evidence in the murder itself. The evidence is a huge break for investigators, especially when... 200 yards from a certain hotel that was of interest to law enforcement. Because that hotel, this modest hotel in Basalt, Colorado, contained Trey and Nancy Styler. While investigators are waiting for forensic results, the hotel's owner makes another key discovery outside the Styler's room. Does a morning check, checking to see just if everything's all right, if anything needs to be tidied up. In a matter of a few feet from the motel room door of Trey and Nancy Styler, it's a key, and on that key it's had a tag, and on that tag it was written owner's closet. It's the key to the closet where Nancy Fister's body was found. The discovery is a game changer. And when the DNA results on the potential murder weapon come back from the crime lab, the case against the Stylers is seemingly solidified. The blood on the hammer through DNA testing proved to be connected to Trey Styler. Both the physical evidence which had come out of that bag and Kathy Carpenter's statements about all the conflict that was going on led the police to feel that they had probable cause to make an arrest. Coming up, as investigators build their case, a shocking revelation suggests the Stylers might not be the real killers after all. Now we're having discussions. Did the Stylers really do this? Are the Stylers being set 
Yeah. That was just another indication to me that the stylers are being framed. have arrested married couple Trey and Nancy Styler for the murder of their former friend and local celebrity, Nancy Pfister. News of the arrest stuns the close-knit community. I couldn't believe it. When I was there, they were all having fun together, laughing, joking, hugging each other, toasting a drink. I, I was shocked when I first heard it. As investigators continue building their case against the Stylers, they struggle to comprehend the killer's carelessness with the evidence. It just raises this fundamental question. If that's a key piece of evidence that would tie you into a murder, why would you leave it 20 steps away from the door of the, where you're staying at the motel? Now we're having discussions. Did the Stylers really do this? Are the Stylers being set up? Or that someone else may be in on it and is planting evidence to pin the murder exclusively on Nancy and Trey. But who would have the motive and the opportunity? One of the crucial pieces of evidence was that there was a key to the closet that was found very close to the Stylers' motel room. This was the key to the owner's closet that was missing. But when it was tested, they were looking to see who had touched that key. It was Kathy Carpenter who had some forensic type evidence on that key. She had obviously access to that key. That was the biggest fact that made me start to think that maybe the stylers were being framed by Kathy Carpenter. Investigators decide to revisit Kathy's statements to police. They begin by examining her 911 call. Kathy said in her 911 call that there was blood all over the body and that when she opened the closet door, she was able to see that it was Nancy Pfister. Hey, is she breathing? She's dead full of blood wrapped in a face. Okay, ma'am, can you get near your friend? No, no, I can't. It was blood. The problem with that was that investigators, when they arrived on scene, couldn't see any blood on the body and, in fact, had to unwrap the body from the garbage bags and the sheets in order to see any blood at all. If you took a look at the crime scene photos, you couldn't tell if it was a man, if it was a woman. All you could see was a little bit of, of white skin and you saw sheets. Her head had been concealed, actually sealed up, in, in another trash bag. There was nothing to indicate any identity of this person. Detectives realized Kathy had also been quick to push suspicion toward the Stylers when she was interviewed by police. Kathy Carpenter immediately mentioned the Stylers. The Stylers were delivered to us on this platter of people that we should be interested in. Investigators speak with Nancy Fister's friends to discuss her relationship with Kathy Carpenter. They learn Kathy had become increasingly bitter about her seven-year friendship with Nancy Fister. Nancy Fister always wanted to be a little bit above these people that she had around her. They didn't seem to be relationships of equals. So there was some indication that maybe time we were sitting on the sofa chatting and she said, Kathy, she screamed for Kathy, who was downstairs and said, we ran out of Prosecco. Go get us some more Prosecco. We ran out. And all of a sudden you hear a car peeling out of that gravel driveway as fast as it could. Kathy was angry. She was tired of being pushed around, but she was pushed around an awful lot. Get me this. Get me that. Friends also revealed that Kathy had become close with the Stylers while Nancy was traveling overseas. Part of Kathy's job was to take care of Nancy Fister's house. So she was over there all the time. And while she was over there, she got to know the Stylers and started spending some personal time with them. They got to know each other and they got to share their grievances 
about Nancy Pfister. Investigators began hearing more and more stories about the Stylers and Kathy Carpenter hanging around town and openly badmouthing Nancy Pfister. On March 1st, police decide to bring Kathy in for another round of questioning. They press her about the inconsistencies in her 911 call and previous statements. Kathy Carpenter, her interview with us sticks to, hey, I knew that was my friend. How did you know that was your friend? Is what we ask her as law enforcement investigators. And at one point in the interview, she actually reaches up to her own head and she said, it's the hair. It's the hair. And she starts stroking. I recognized her blonde hair. There was no hair free flowing from underneath this sealed bag that was actually literally tied around the neck of Nancy Pfister. Still, Kathy refuses to implicate herself. It's time. I'll burn in your heart. Let's talk about the truth. Let's talk about what happened. It's time, Kathy. If you can't keep... I didn't do it. I don't know what to say. I was not in cahoots. I did not want to say cahoots with the Tyler's. Despite her claims of innocence, authorities believe they have enough circumstantial evidence against Kathy. Eleven days after the Stylers were taken into custody, Kathy Carpenter is the third person arrested and charged with Nancy Pfister's murder. When she got arrested with the Stylers, I was really surprised that she was involved. When I first heard about it, I couldn't believe it. Like, holy moly, what the hell did Kathy do? Coming up, an unexpected confession threatens to upend the case, leading to more questions, theories, and doubts about what really happened to Nancy Pfister. Me as a cop was so shocking that they could lie to that extent. in Aspen, Colorado, have indicted three people for the murder of celebrated socialite Nancy Pfister, her former close friends and tenants, Nancy and Trey Styler, and her longtime assistant and friend, Kathy Carpenter. As the first preliminary hearing approaches, prosecutors solidify their theory for motive. Kathy Carpenter being a follower needing somebody to show her attention. She found that in the Stylers, and they bonded over their mutual hatred uh, of Nancy Pfister. We believe that the Stylers were the driving force. Stylers lost everything. They had nowhere to go. They were desperate. They were lost. They just didn't know what to do, and what desperate people do sometimes is lash out. Then, one week before the preliminary hearing is scheduled, Trey Styler makes an unexpected plea. Trey Styler contacts through his lawyer the prosecution team and says, I wanna I wanna talk to you. So they bring him in, they bring him in his wheelchair, and he tells them, I did this, I did it all by myself. According to Trey Styler, on the morning of February 25th, he went to Nancy Pfister's house to try and talk with her about the escalating drama. Trey admits to police that he still had a key to the house, so he lets himself in. He goes up the stairs. He doesn't hear anything there. He goes into Nancy Pfister's bedroom. He walks in the door. He sees her sleeping in her bed. She has on her eye mask and her earplugs, which is what she was known for. And she's just lying there in front of him. He said he saw her there sleeping, and he just felt this rage, and he he crushed her head with a hammer. After Trey was sure Nancy Pfister was dead, he tells investigators how he cleaned up his crime. He said he and he alone moved her body to the floor. He said he and he alone dragged her body to the closet, wrapped her in sheets. He said he and he alone flipped the mattress. Investigators heard his story, but they weren't buying it. They did not believe that he could have acted on it. 
How much could he actually move, stand, you know, lift? And when asked about committing that crime, he just said, well, I can only attribute it to the adrenaline effect. In exchange for his cooperation, Trey asks authorities to drop the charges against his wife, Nancy, and Kathy Carpenter. I said in that interview room, just not believing Trey Styler. He was throwing himself on the sword. He was taking the rap so Nancy could go free. He was also telling us Kathy Carpenter had no involvement in this at all. From my review of the evidence, I just didn't see anything that suggested that Nancy Styler had anything to do with it. Without any physical evidence to disprove his story, authorities know they won't have a foolproof case against Nancy Styler or Kathy Carpenter. After Trey Styler had confessed to the murder, Nancy Styler and Kathy Carpenter were basically let off. You know, Nancy Styler was let off with prejudice, which means that she could never be charged with the case again. Kathy Carpenter, on the other hand, was released without prejudice in legal terms, meaning that she was still under the umbrella of suspicion. On June 20th, 2014, Trey Styler pleads guilty to second degree murder inside a packed Aspen courtroom. He's sentenced to 20 years in prison. While justice is served in the case against Trey Styler, not everyone agrees with the district attorney's decision. I would not have signed on to participate in the arrest of Trey and Nancy Styler if I didn't believe both were part of committing the murder of Nancy Pfister. I wholeheartedly believed when I signed on to participate in the arrest and be part of it that Kathy Carpenter was involved in the murder of Nancy Pfister. This was a resolution that was distasteful and disgusting to me as a cop, but at least we were holding someone accountable. Everybody could have gone free. Following his incarceration, Trey Styler agrees to sit down with a book author and describes how he committed the murder despite his medical condition. I still have some of my body strength. And once my lower body, I stabbed my best shot. In his interview, Trey also reiterates his wife's innocence. The idea of her doing such a thing or being involved in such a thing is so insane to me. When they arrested her, that destroyed me. Guilty plea, Trey kills himself in his prison cell. He hung himself in a cell, hung himself to death. He took the easy way out, and I'd rather see him rot in prison. You know, uh, he should suffer. As for Nancy Styler and Kathy Carpenter, they both still vehemently maintain their innocence. In my heart, I did not believe she had anything to do with the murder. Nancy loved her husband. It completely blew her mind that this man that she was married to was capable of this kind of an act. Today, there's still a strong feeling in the Aspen community that the case may never be fully resolved. In the aftermath of the crime, there was a lot of anger in Aspen among people we interviewed, among people we talked to, who absolutely felt that justice had not been done for Nancy Pfister. The town of Aspen loved Nancy Pfister. Okay, she was iconic. She lived her life the way she wanted to live it. She had fun, and she had fun a lot. And she shared her, her good fortune and her friendship with all of her friends. She was too young to pass. She had too much life left in her. I would just pray to God it never happens to anyone else again.
He wanted to marry her. He was ready to be there for her and the baby. She loved the idea of having a whole family with him. But a violent crime would destroy their chance at a happy ending. There was what appeared to be gunshot wounds to her chest area. A staged crime scene indicates that the subject had a plan to commit the crime and had a plan to make an effort to confuse the investigation. The search for the killer will stretch across state lines and unearth a myriad of scandals and secret love affairs. She was maybe harboring some type of hope that she could have him to herself. They certainly are red flags that there is some sort of danger in this relationship. If he could not have her, he was going to kill her. It was the worst emotional and physical pain that I have ever felt in my life. It's soul crushing. suburban community nestled within the bustling metropolis of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Fort George Meade, uh, Army base, been there for, you know, very long time. The base is quite a large base these days. Severn is sort of the community that surrounds the base. A lot of people that work in the Army and the Armed Forces live in that community. But just before 8 a.m. on August 25th, 2015, the usual Tuesday morning calm is disturbed when the Anne Arundel County Police receive a call from a concerned maintenance man at the Lake Village townhomes. A maintenance worker in a townhome community had discovered an open uh, sliding rear door of a townhome. It was just odd. I don't think the maintenance worker had any indication of who was inside, but, but clearly recognized something wasn't right. Thought that it best that the police check it out. The Anne Arundel County Police arrived. Um, they find a, an open door with no one answering. Uh, so initially, they don't know what they're dealing with. You know, did someone just leave a door open? Is this uh, some sort of robbery? Is it something else? Is anyone there? Is anyone hurt? Does anyone need assistance? The residence itself was was like a townhouse without a basement, two stories, you know, ground level and then a second story where all the bedrooms were. They decided to go ahead and, and enter the apartment downstairs area, and then they went upstairs. When we went into the upstairs of the townhouse, um, they looked at the master bedroom, and we saw a body lying on the floor. It was apparent that the, the woman was, was deceased. Upon closer inspection, the officer realizes there's a second victim. There's not only was uh, a, uh, an adult female lying prone on the floor, a infant child was cradled in her arms. When the officer moved closer to the individuals, the baby made some movement and some sound, and the officer was relieved that the child was alive. He picked up the child and, and, and brought her outside to the paramedics for, you know, immediate assessment. Detectives are immediately called to the scene. The victim was on the ground. There was what appeared to be gunshot wounds um, to her chest area. Obviously, the consideration was that this was likely a, a homicide situation. When I responded to the crime scene, there's numerous police cars and some members of the military responded to the crime scene, specifically Sergeant McDaniels. A detective came over to talk to me, and I'm like, I have two female soldiers that live in that apartment. What's going on? Sergeant McDaniels informs detectives that the residence belongs to 24-year-old Army Specialist Carlin Ramirez. Sergeant McDaniels also informed us that there was another uh, uh, adult female roommate that lived in the apartment, that her name was Marissa. He also stated that he knew the roommate, Marissa, was away on vacation. He was concerned because Carlin hadn't arrived at work that morning. Based on Sergeant McDaniel's statement, detectives believe the woman inside the townhome is Carlin. I woke up to my phone just ringing over and over. There was a police officer on the phone, and I knew 
I knew something bad happened. And all I could ask was, is she okay? And she told me no. During the investigation of Carlin's murder, we resulted to her victimology. Growing up in Del Rio, Texas, Carlin Ramirez always understood the value of family and tradition from a young age. Carlin's family was very important to her. She always had nothing but a CS degree and then uh, decided that the military would probably be a better fit for her. I think mostly because um, our mother was in the military when she was young, right before she had my sister Carlin. And then, of course, her aunt was also a retired veteran from the military. So she saw it as my family did it. Maybe it's a good fit for me. She wanted to see the world. She wanted to help people. She just had this this hunger and this drive to to want to do better and want to be better and want to make the world a better place for everybody. When she deployed to South Korea in 2013, Carlin met the man who would change her life forever. 35-year-old chemical weapons specialist Malik Kearney. In the military, he was highly regarded and highly decorated for the work that he did. He'd earned several awards and was well thought of by his colleagues in the military, and he took great pride in his military service. Malik was a lot older and more mature. Carlin just thought that physically he was very attractive. She would tell me she liked the way that he held his confidence. He was a very independent, very confident man. He really knew what he wanted. She fell completely head over heels for him. Malik also fell in love with the beautiful 22-year-old Carlin. After nearly six months of dating, it was clear to friends and family that the relationship had grown serious. She got home for Thanksgiving for the first time, and then she was like, hey, I have a surprise. I'm pregnant. Shortly after, Malik proposed, and Carlin readily accepted. Before the couple had time to get married, however, Carlin was reassigned to Fort Meade, Maryland. Malik was supposed to come over to Fort Meade with Carlin so they could be together and continue the relationship, but his orders were denied. He was sent to South Carolina while she was still pregnant, and um, she was living in Maryland. On April 23, 2015, Malik joined Carlin in Maryland for the birth of their daughter. We walked in, and you just saw the biggest smile on Carlin's face and how proud she was of her sweet, little, precious daughter, and just was so ecstatic to show her off. Three months later, Carlin and Malik tied the knot before new military rules were enforced that would prohibit their relationship. They got married mid-July in South Carolina. Someone got ordained and married them very quickly. Their rush to get married was because she was a loyalist soldier and he was a seymour. November of the year they got married is when that rule changed. She was just so happy. She was happy with her baby. She was happy with her man. And she, she was happy that he wanted to build a family and take care of both of them. By August 2015, Carlin had returned to work. She and Malik began making plans for him to join her in Maryland. But just a few weeks later, all their dreams for the future come crashing down in an instant when police discover Carlin's lifeless body inside her home. In that bedroom, the bedding had been pulled off on the ground near where the victim was laying. It was clear that some sort of conversation had occurred. When we first looked at the victim, her underwear and shorts had been sort of pulled down. The underwear was around her knees area. There was slight bruising on her, as well as scratches. We do have to consider the possibility that this was a sexual assault. Coming up, the search for a killer leads police to confront someone close to the victim. But a scandalous 
alleged revelation will change the course of the investigation. There was still some talking between them, seeing each other kind of in secret. Detectives in Severn, Maryland are investigating the shooting death of 24-year-old Army Specialist Carlin Ramirez. Carlin was found on the floor of her bedroom, cradling her four-month-old daughter, who was left unharmed. This murder shocked the community, as well as just completely surprised and devastated her family. It was the worst emotional and physical pain that I have ever felt in my life. You get waves of how it felt that day, and it was... It's so crushing. At the crime scene, Carlin's body is removed by the coroner for autopsy, and detectives collect crucial evidence. There was actually one bullet that was laying on the floor. In relatively short order, uh, firearms experts from Anne Arundel County were able to determine that, that those bullets were fired from a 357 uh, caliber. to search the crime scene, we located a condom wrapper. Uh, in the wrapper, we located a condom. These things were all collected as evidence, and it certainly added to the, the possibility that, that some sort of sexual assault had occurred. We know that we have a forensic process to look into that, which would be done during the autopsy. Hoping to gather more information about Carlin, detectives question her supervisor, Sergeant Leroy McDaniels. Sergeant McDaniels told me that her husband, Millie Kearney, was actually stationed in South Carolina in Fort Jackson, and they were physically separated due to their different military assignments. But Sergeant McDaniels reveals that life for the newlyweds was not as blissful as expected. Detectives learned that a month earlier, Carlin had called with surprising information. I received a phone call, you know, at night from Carlin and Malik expressing that Carlin had developed a physical relationship with another soldier. Malik, he was enraged uh, upon learning about Carlin's affair. He forced her to report it to, uh, to her line of command because uh, it's one thing that's not allowed. Sergeant McDaniels tells detectives that he was required to report the extramarital affair, which carried a stiff penalty under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And that subsequently led to a reduction in rank and loss of pay for both Ms. Ramirez and the other service member. My sister was stripped of everything that she earned because of what she did. She was not proud of herself for it, like... It made her feel terrible because it's not who she was as a person. According to Sergeant McDaniels, after the demotion, Carlin and Malik's relationship only continued to spiral. Once he made her report herself, she did still try to stick it out, but he got more obsessive and more demeaning toward her. Ultimately, Carlin asked Malik for a divorce. He would call her constantly trying to convince her to stay don't leave don't leave she's like no i don't want this i don't want this for me i don't want this for my baby carlin ramirez requested a no contact order be issued by the army against malik kearney malik kearney was to have no further contact directly or indirectly with carlin ramirez she put in the no contact order so he wouldn't just show up at her house she didn't want to deal with it she's like, i'm done i'm done with the whole Armed with this new information, seventh. Before we arrived there, uh, his commanding officer and chaplain advised Malik that Carlin had passed away, but they did not say what had happened to Carlin. When detectives sit down with Malik, he appears devastated.
Malik seemed upset and uh, he cried. And he said that he would cooperate with the investigation. So, what can you, what can you tell us about her? Overcome with emotion, 
the sergeant told the police that he was an angry at Harlan and actually that, that the pair had been continued to see each other even after they were demoted. There was, was still some uh, talking uh, between them and seeing each other kind of in secret. When detectives confront the man with the DNA evidence, he two days before she was found murdered. We did learn that he visited Carlin on Sunday evening. He actually lived nearby. They had an intimate encounter. That encounter, according to him, was, you know, a consensual encounter. We knew from Carlin's roommate that they were dating, and Carlin had sought a babysitter that evening for her baby. The man tells detectives that the condom found in Carlin's trash can was thrown out after they were together on August 23rd. He was extremely cooperative. He was forthcoming in his relationship with her. He provided his cell phone that he used to correspond with Carlin. He allowed us to search his car. He allowed us to search his living quarters. He wanted to assure us that he had nothing to do with her death. When detectives pressed the man about his whereabouts the day before Carlin was found, he claims he was at home all night. He turned his cell phone over and he consented to a polygraph. He did very well in the polygraph and did not show deception during the polygraph. His cell phone showed his phone was not anywhere close to Carlin. We couldn't develop any evidence that he left his house that night to go to Carlin's house. His alibi checked out. They determined him to be truthful in, in terms of what he said, so they were able to eliminate him as a, as a suspect. Just when detectives think they've hit another dead end, a new lead surfaces. While going through Carlin's cell phone, I also learned that she recently met another individual who was in the military but in a different state. However, Carlin uh, recently started to date this individual. On August 24th, the day before we discovered Carlin murdered, I saw that there was communication in Carlin's phone that she was texting, asking him to spend some time with her. Detectives immediately contact the individual and bring him in for questioning. He explains that he had hooked up with Carlin a week earlier. Carlin and I decided to go to Virginia Beach to visit my family. It was a night that we decided to have a girls' night, a mom's night out. Carlin was fearless. She went on the dance floor and had a dance-off with some guy. He was actually an old high school friend. They hit it off. They ended up exchanging numbers, and they text back and forth. He confirmed that two days before they had been together. The two decided to have dinner, and they were intimate at that time. Carlin texted him the next day and wanted him to come back so they could be together again, but he declined. She was very far away from her family, and her roommate was also out of town. And she seemed to be a little lonely. The second paramour was extensively interviewed. Uh, he was found to be truthful. It was determined both from his cell site information from his telephone as well as his account of the events of the 24th of uh, August. He was not anywhere near Severn, Maryland at or about the time of her death. With the investigation at a standstill, detectives revisit Malik Kearney as a possible person of interest. They comb through his cell phone records to confirm his whereabouts the night of Carlin's murder. As investigators accumulated uh, data from the various service providers, they ascertained that Sergeant Kearney's telephone was indeed present in South Carolina on the evening of the 24th into the morning of the 25th of August, 2015. They were able to identify the closest cell towers to his apartment, and it appeared to investigators that his phone was in or nearby his apartment at all times. But when detectives receive the forensic results on Malik's cell phone, they discover something alarming. There was an application which was deleting data from the phone. We determined by evaluating his cell phone that this wipe app was active during the time of the murder, and more so the next day, which was the day that Carlin was discovered. 
having a wipe app installed on your phone the day that your wife is murdered is very suspicious. Coming up, as detectives zero in on their primary suspect, another affair comes to light. Their relationship was very intimate and powerful almost. They were pointing the finger at her that she was the person who actually killed Carlin Ramirez. It's been two days since police in Severn, Maryland, discovered Carlin Ramirez dead from an apparent homicide. So far, her estranged husband, Malik Kearney, has had a solid alibi. But when detectives begin breaking down his cell phone records, they discover he had installed an app that was deleting data from his cell phone. Most of the data had been wiped clean from his phone, but forensic investigators were able to recover certain bits. Of there were a tremendous amount of communication, text message and calls to a person labeled Dodo. When we did the research on that number, we were able to realize that it belonged to a woman named Dolores Delgado. Detectives learned that Dolores is a 30-year-old Army veteran living in Merritt Island, Florida. Dolores Delgado was originally from New Mexico. She'd been in the military and apparently served at least a tour in Iraq. She had since moved to Florida after her departure from the military to pursue a career in the medical field. Hoping to learn more about Dolores' connection to Malik, detectives traveled to Florida to confront her. I responded to Dolores' apartment and I introduced myself her response was to the effect of, oh, do you, do you want to talk to me about Malik? And I told her, yes, I do want to talk to you about Malik, actually. She agreed to accompany us to a local police station where we could learn more about her and interview her. Detectives sit down with Dolores and ask her to elaborate on her relationship with Malik. She starts by telling detectives that their relationship began in 2008, six years before Malik met Carlin. Dolores told me that she had met Malik while they were deployed together overseas. She and Malik had been involved in an on-again, off-again relationship over several years. They would seek each other out during different trainings and try to keep in touch through Facebook and text messages, and they often would visit each other depending on, on where they were. Dolores Delgado described her relationship with Kearney as being very complicated. She was aware that he had other women in his life, and she also had other men in her life. But Dolores claimed she never wanted to come between Malik and his wife, Carlin. Dolores stated that uh, Malik was trying very hard to get back with his wife, Carlin, and that she was actually providing relationship advice so that they could succeed in the marriage. When detectives break the news that Carlin has been killed, Dolores appears shocked. When she was confronted about what happened, did she know anything about the murder? She said no, she didn't know about the murder, and she didn't have anything to do with it. She denied any responsibility or any knowledge. She said that that night of the murder, um, she was at his apartment and she said he was there. I asked her if uh, Malik borrowed her car and she said that Malik had not, that Malik was asleep in the bedroom. As detectives hear Dolores' statement, they must consider one glaring detail from Malik's. Telling the police that she was with Malik, that contradicts what Malik had said. He had told police that he had been alone that night. Before releasing Dolores, detectives seize her phone. As they scour the explicit messages, they come across one from Malik that raises major concerns. While reviewing the text messages of uh, 
Dolores' phone, there was a text message exchange prior to the murder where Malik texts her and says, this gun is so dang loud. The revelation that Dolores and Malik had been discussing a gun prompts detectives to dig further into Dolores' digital history. They start with her social media accounts. Looking at the social media postings recovered from Dolores' Delgado's phone, they saw reference to her uh, proposed sale of 357 caliber ammunition. Investigators were aware that the murder weapon was a 357 caliber revolver. The ammunition included a photograph of a price tag in the name of the business where the ammunition came from. We contacted that store and learned that, in fact, Dolores had previously owned a 357 handgun. We had linked Carlin Ramirez death to that gun. We had linked that gun to Dolores Delgado because she purchased it. And we had the text messages from Malik Kearney, Dodo, that gun is so damn loud. It was a critical compilation of evidence. As the investigation was going on, we found out that Malik Kearney had moved from Fort Jackson, had sought a transfer to Texas. And we found shortly after that, Dolores Delgado moved to the same area of Texas. So we realized they were together, they were in close proximity, and felt that we needed to take action quickly. In October 2016, authorities arrest... The grand jury returned an indictment against Malik Kearney and Dolores Delgado for interstate travel to commit domestic violence resulting in the death of Carla Ramirez and the use of a firearm in her death. The arrest of Malik Kearney and Dolores Delgado made national news. The national news coverage benefited investigators significantly because it caused a witness to come forward in Florida who knew Dolores Delgado. The witness claims that Dolores had asked him for help discarding a gun in late August 2015. He said they disassembled a revolver, attempted to destroy the uh, serial number on that revolver, and then threw the parts of the gun into the water off this fishing pier. The witness leads detectives to the Banana River where he claims Dolores disposed of the gun. Fortunately, it was not too deep in that area, so the four pieces were recovered. The FBI lab were able to establish that it was, in fact, the same serial number of the revolver that Dolores had purchased from that gun shop. They were able to uh, take the barrel from that gun. They actually attached it to a new gun to conduct test fires. Bullets that were fired down that barrel bore the same signature marks of the bullets that were recovered at the scene. Detectives know this evidence seemingly solidifies their case against Dolores Delgado. But without Malik's cooperation, authorities fear they'll face a he said, she said at trial. I 100 believe that they needed each other to complete this. I don't think that either one of them would be courageous enough to pull the trigger by themselves. They did it because they had each other, and when they came down to it, if they had to, they could blame each other, which is exactly what happened. In October 2016, investigators have arrested Dolores Delgado and Malik Kearney for the brutal murder of 24-year-old Carlin Ramirez. Hoping to solidify their case against Malik, authorities decide to give Dolores an opportunity to come clean. When we spoke with Dolores Delgado, we gave her a snapshot of the evidence that we had accumulated against her because we believed that she was an accessory and a critical part. We believed Malik Kearney did that. 
she agreed to tell the truth, and she agreed to testify against Malik Kearney, if necessary. As detectives listen, Dolores offers a full confession. She tells them that on the afternoon of August 24th, she arrived at Malik's apartment according to his direction. Dolores provided the firearm, the ammunition, and her vehicle. Malik asked Dolores to stream movies and use his cell phone while he was gone, so it appeared that he was home the whole time, providing an electronic alibi. He then took Dolores' car and drove to Maryland. According to Dolores, when Malik returned to the apartment early the next morning, he gave her a play-by-play -play of the murder. Malik described to her he let himself inside Carlin's house by using a key that he already had and was met by Carlin and he forced her to go upstairs. Dolores said that Malik told her that while he was there that Carlin tried to fight him and tried to fight the gun away and his first shot missed her and the rest of his shots end up hitting her. underwear and took off her pants to make it look like there was some sort of uh, sexual assault. He placed the baby in her arm that he headed out the back door. I think Dolores was maybe harboring a, some type of hope that if Malik killed his wife that somehow he would come back to her, that she could have him to herself. The nature of the relationship is difficult to understand and was toxic way that together they would plan the murder of Carl Ramirez. Dolores Delgado entered a plea of guilty to conspiracy to commit interstate uh, travel to commit a crime of violence against uh, Carl Ramirez. That guilty plea was accepted by the court and then we prepared for trial against uh, Malik Kearney alone. On July 16th, 2018, the trial against Malik Kearney begins in court in Baltimore. The prosecution's star witness is Dolores Delgado. Dolores' testimony was very powerful to the jury. It showed essentially this control that he had over women. In this case, he wanted this control over Carlin. He truly didn't want anybody else to have Carlin and that she wasn't giving in, so he decided to kill her. The defense team attempting to shift blame solely to Dolores on August 9th. 2018, the jury sides with the prosecution. Malik Kearney was found guilty by the jury of both counts. The interstate travel to commit domestic violence against his wife, Carla Ramirez, and uh, that violence resulted in her death, as well as the use of a firearm in that domestic violence charge causing the death of Carla Ramirez. Malik Kearney was sentenced to life without parole, plus 10. Dolores Delgado was sentenced to 17 years by the court. It really is a terrible, a terrible thing. It's a pain you have to live with forever. We never forget. It's, it's changed all of our lives. It's it dimmed all of our lives a little bit. When people bring her up and they have memories about her, of course, we love to hear it. We talk about it, too. It's the way that we keep her alive. She always brought out the best in people. And I know every day the way I choose to treat people is because of how loving and thoughtful she was toward me. She was an outstanding person. Outstanding mother, friend, sister, best friend, soldier.